Before we proceed any further, I just want to acknowledge um, that the Kluge-Ru and the Freeland are located on the land of the Monica Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And since we are all joining from locations uh, around the nation and the world, I just want to acknowledge um, all of the Indigenous nations where each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who those Indigenous peoples are, that you find out and that you learn about them and their art and culture. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to um, welcome us all here today. All right. Um, my name is Lisa Jevak, and I am the assistant to the director and special projects coordinator at the Freeland Museum of Art. And we want to welcome everyone to the fourth webinar in the Art in Life series, where the Freeland and the Kluge Ru both museums at the University of Virginia are investigating art forms that don't typically show up in the museum. We felt that there are all kinds of art forms that are culturally dense, deeply tied to identity, and formally and technically complex that deserved our attention. Often these are taken for granted because they are part of our daily lives and aren't set aside or labeled as deserving of our attention. So each panelist is going to speak for a few minutes about their own relationship with the world of comic books. And then we have some questions for all the speakers to help guide a discussion. Then we'll open it up for a live Q&A. And as Lauren mentioned, we will do our best to get to all the audience questions as time allows. So let's get started. Um, and our first, uh, artist who's going to kick off this introduction is Gonzo. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Gonzo, I'm a, a comic book creator and lifelong uh, comic book fan, uh, you know, starting primarily in the 70s and 80s Marvel superhero comics. Uh, I unashamedly love superhero comics. Uh, I know that's sometimes not a cool notion. Uh, and uh, I uh, have been an artist my entire life. I ended up attending the Orange County High School of the Arts uh, visual art program where uh, my love of comic books was uh, a little bit poo-pooed um, and I kind of had to keep it a secret. So then I uh, moved to um, getting a degree in graphic design and ultimately learning how to tattoo, but falling back into graphic design for a living. Uh, but I've worked as a professional creative uh, since 1993. So I'm coming up on like, I think my uh, coming up on 30 years of being a professional creative and I've worked around comic books for a long time. Uh, I filled almost every capacity, been a penciler, anchor, colorist, letterer, all of these jobs uh, with my own book. I actually um, pencil, ink, letter, color, everything. I also do the design. I also act as a publisher and distribute them. Uh, and then most notably in my capacity in the professional industry, I, I uh, was a senior art director for Todd McFarlane for uh, four years, uh, working on his comic titles and toys and what have you. Um, in addition to uh, my own comic, La Mano del Destino, I've also done work for um, uh, Top Cow Comics doing La Voz de Mayo with Henry Barajas as a writer. So I've worked in tandem with writers before. Uh, I've done stuff for uh, Headlocked Comics, a uh, uh, wrestling story featuring Taya Valkyrie. So I've worked with you know talent and a writer and an intermediary. Um, but uh, I, I just love comic books. I love telling these stories. Uh, I think I've always just kind of been drawn to trash culture, I guess, or a lowbrow culture to a degree um, because it wrestles art away, from, you know, no pun intended. Uh, it wrestles art away from the elites and it gets it out of museums. And it, it is art to most people. I mean, it is it is the place where, you know, um, I would like to say that I learned more about personal accountability from Spider-Man than I did from the Buddha, right? I, it's just, it's, it's a place where ideas are acceptable and presented in a palatable way. So I've just, I've been a fan of them and, and to take something like a comic book and superhero tropes and some things that can be cliched and, and passe and then foisting my own kind of uh, identity struggles as a Chicano in America into the story that I crafted for Lamano Mano it's just, the subversion of all of those art forms just is uh, something that I take great pleasure in. So that's what's brought me to comic books. Cool, thank you so much, Gonzo. Yep. Um, I think we're gonna move on. We're just, I think we have a few more slides of your work and then we'll move on to Jonathan Mark's favorite video. Hey, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, so my name's Jonathan. I, uh, uh, much like Gonzo, you know, just grew up reading comic books and and Marvel superheroes, stuff like that. My, uh, when I was young, you know, loved comic books, loved drawing and painting. And at a certain point, you know, the sort of light switch went off that someone makes these things. And so that's that's what I wanna do. That's, you know, the obvious thing, the obvious career choice for me. 
So I knew from you know pretty young that I wanted to make comic books, but it wasn't really until professionally uh, making and producing books that I realized how how varied that idea really is. And even within making comics, drawing comics, it, you know, is so varied across so many different uh, artists. So when I first started, Gonzo even mentioned this too, I, I very much subscribe to the idea that traditional, you know, there's a pencil, there's an inker, there's a letter, there's a colorist. There's very specific jobs there and those people do very specific things. And I sort of, as I was working and, and building my own voice, started to recognize that that's not, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And for me in particular, it was a hindrance to uh, more of an honest voice and a, and a more of a natural sort of storytelling uh, that I wanted to do. So that realization, you know, really opened my eyes and, and I went more down the path of painting and, and utilizing what I would describe as like uh, an emotional line and an emotional shape to, to tell the stories that I'm telling, moving more into abstraction and more into almost impressionism while still maintaining sort of comic book sensibilities because like at the end of the day I love comics and I love making the comics I don't want to make something else I want to pay homage to to sort of the art form itself while making art that's sort of emotionally resonates with me and and the coolest thing about comics to me is they can look like anything it, I mean that's an oversimplification but but let's for argument's sake they can look like anything and so Gonzo and I and all of our peers we have the same job but go about it in such completely different ways. And it's fascinating to see, for me, it's fascinating to see how that sort of the idea of the storyteller is, is the base level. That's, that's our job, but we all come at it from completely different places and, and tell those stories in completely different ways. So that's what keeps me sort of interested and in, in, in love with this medium. Awesome, thanks Jonathan. Yeah, um, yeah. It's always nice to hear the commonalities between uh, artists doing similar but different things. Um, so Shilpa, we'll finish introduction wise with you and I will get to your slide. These are artwork images and that means that they are very high res and the screen share is having a little bit of a hard time uh, <laughs> progressing through. <laughs> there we go. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And thank you, Lauren and Lisa, for inviting me to be a part of this um, wonderful panel. Uh, I am a fan of comics. And so I admire all the work that Gonzo and Jonathan do. I, alas, cannot draw, but I do admire drawings. And one of the things that I'm very, very interested in is the relationship um, between how we look at visual imagery and how we create stories out of the visual imagery. So my background is that um, I grew up with comics and I used to read like Archie comics, but I also was a big reader. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably not a coincidence that I became an English major and then later I went into cultural studies and now I'm in media studies. But I've always, I've always loved text, but before that, I really, really enjoyed comics, but I couldn't always afford them. So I would go to my public library and pick up the latest Marvel comic. But then when I would go back the next week, I might not get them in order. And so I would have to sort of figure out what was going on if I missed an issue or two. And so what I love about comics is that you can go in and you can look at the visuals and if you don't know the story right away, you can also create a story in your own head. So it's very individual. And at the same time, it's collective because it involves you in, um, in this universe um, that, uh, that you know, a lot of other people can, can talk about. Now, I was only one of the only girls and one of the only women when I was going into comic book stores. And I was always highly, <laughs> highly resident, you know, recognizing of, of that particular kind of moment. And so when I started um, doing my teaching when I was a graduate student, and then later on, when I was, um, um, uh, when I was doing teaching um, here and in other places, I started introducing comics into when I was teaching courses on popular culture. And so um, my work, if you go to the next slide, is actually interest 
interested in, I'm interested in popular culture. And that's a lot of what I teach. And I particularly look at the relationship between race and representation in American popular culture. And um, the first collection, the book collection that I did is on the left here, it's East Main Street. The cover was actually penned, um, and it was an original cover by Tak Toyashima, who is actually an artist, a cartoonist um, for a character called Secret Asian Man. And for our for my other collection, we actually got an artist um, uh, who is uh, Shizu uh, Saldamando uh, to do, and this is a painting that she did called um, Carm's Crew. And then you can see for my own book, um, I went more to video and TV. But what I really wanted to say, in addition to my um, own work, is you can tell I love the visual and I love popular culture because of the ways in which it interacts with a lot of different people. Now, why do I think comics are important to include in a college curriculum? I think part of that is because of the way in which we think about um, American mythology. And the person who also talks about comics and the way we, and he's written a book called Understanding Comics is on the next slide. And it's uh, Scott McCloud. And he talked about the superhero as a modern mythology, and I would say particularly a modern American mythology. And if you look at the next slide, um, we think about Wonder Woman, for example. Um, we think about Superman, Batman, Captain America. They all came out of this idea of American nationalism sort of right before World War II. And what I was always interested in, in talking to my students was how do we take characters that were born out of the moment of World War II and American nationalism, and how do they, we make them relevant to the ways in which we're thinking now? Uh, and that's what the comics industry has had to do. So in the 1960s, um, Marvel Comics came out with characters that were relevant in terms of thinking about class issues like Superman, or I'm sorry, like Spider-Man, or thinking about how uh, difference is negotiated when you feel like an outsider, like with X-Men. And they also came up with how we looked at the feminist movement. And so they created characters like Ms. Marvel. But for a popular culture, for the 21st century and the 20 teens, how do we see that? And if you go to the next slide, the creators of um, modern day movements are people like um, Kamala Khan, who is the new Ms. Marvel. And you can see from this slide, you go from Ms. Marvel, who came, who's Carol Danvers, to becoming uh, Kamala Khan, who's a Pakistani American teenager from Jersey City. And what was particularly important to me as I started to teach on um, issues related to race and representation was who the creators were. And the creators of Kamala Khan on the next slide are Sana Amanat and G. Willow Wilson, two women, uh, one who is uh, Pakistani American and the other one who is an American mu Muslim woman. And if you go to the next slide, you can just see them. And when they came out with Ms. Marvel, in uh, 2014, it became a huge hit, uh, became one of the most popular comics um, to be sold, especially online. Uh, and the next slide, you see that the person who actually drew the book is Adrian Alfonso. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the next slide, and then if you go to the next slide, you can see that the way in which her and her family is drawn is very, very different. Mm -hmm. And Finally, just to let you know how much that she has been uh, adapted and, and talked about so much, she, her image was used in um, anti-hate campaigns um, in San Francisco in 2015. And graffiti street artists used her image on San Francisco buses to uh, stop Islamophobia and other um, areas of um, anti-hate um, and racist speech. And so she's become an icon, particularly for the, our times. And I think the image is on the, on the next slide. And so I think that's one of the reasons why she's so interesting. It's And comics can be really important because they come outside of the world of the book and into and can be very um, inspirational for other kinds of movements that are happening. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shopa. Um, 
gosh, you each have already tapped on so many fascinating sort of breaking down of boundaries, which is what this program is all about from breaking down um, sort of the different breaking out of the like prescribed roles of what it means to be a comic book artist, but also um, uh, show up with some of the things that you just mentioned. Um, thank you each so much for sort of giving us a nice little introduction to what you do. Um, I want to start with a question. So part of one of the things about this program is that it assumes that the topics that we're covering aren't really considered fine art. Um, and Gonzo, I think you actually mentioned that as part of your intro, that it's sort of a part of lowbrow culture. Um, and I would love to hear from all of you about like why, why do you think it's not in the art museum? Because certainly um, there are so many rich aesthetic and creative decisions that go into the making of them. Um, they are totally reflective of um, cultural moments, which we just heard from Shilpa. So um, yeah, I just want to open up the floor to whoever wants to tackle that first to think about sort of why, A, your experiences about about how they have not been considered fine art, maybe you wanted them to be, and or why, why you think they're not normally sort of included in that sphere. Who wants to take a stab? Oh, Gonzo, Gonzo uh, you're take muted. off your, I'm mute, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'll take a quick stab. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm going to say just the commercial aspect of it, the fact that there's advertising in them, that they're sold in mass quantities, that they're produced for mass consumption, and they're meant to be consumed and throw away, thrown away, uh, just discounts a lot of the kind of, um, you know, scarcity, uh, one of a kind, those sorts of notions of what we, our, our idea of art, um, you know, doesn't really embrace that. I mean, you know, in fact, uh, you know, it took someone like Lichtenstein to appropriate the art form and then make this meticulously recreation of that exact style, but now it's one of a kind. And it's kind of like the anti-Warhol the anti -Warhol approach. Like Warhol took things that were special and then repeated them so many times they lost their specialness. And that was the exploration of that. You know, like let's take Marilyn Monroe, who's one of a kind and do like 90 of her in a row. Now she's less special. Now let's take something special like a soup can or not special like a soup can that there's a million of at the grocery store and just do one of them. And that's what like Lichtenstein did. And I think that kind of like how many of them there are, like how they're, they're meant to be consumed, uh, a lot of that kind of um, the easy access points for people to point to specialness gets lost there, right? Like, you know, it, it's like the idea of um, simple drawings versus like really complex drawings, you know, like a lot of people don't see a lot of lines on paper. There's not a lot of rigor there. And they think that a simple drawing is worth less than a complicated drawing. It's just, it's a metric that that people who don't understand art or who don't like, I don't, I guess don't engage with it on any level other than like, um, like metrics, like quantifiable things. It's easy for them to just go like, well, a lot of them are made, they're made in a hurry. Uh, and honestly, they just don't investigate them. They don't read the stories and see the complexities of them. So they, they have the shorthand in their head that think that they're all Archie comics or, you know, like from the fifties and they, they just deal with, uh, uh, oh yeah, he's just going to punch the bad guy and life will go back to normal they don't understand the complexity and, and the nuance of stories that have been told since the beginning. They haven't been that ever really. It's just what pe the shorthand people have created in their mind. So that's my thought on why the actual art itself gets poo-pooed is because, uh, because the unfamiliarity and, and consumerism. And that commercialization. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, I'm oh, sorry. Chippa. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. I was just going to say, just to, to chime in with that too. Um, when you talk about consumerism, it's also who is the target audience too? And it's mostly young people. It's mostly teenagers, right? Um, who are the, the audience and what can they afford <laughs> in terms of actually buying the comic books too? And so if you think about it, it the marketplace of who can actually consume these do we see a lot of teenagers going into or feeling welcome in museums? I mean, in some in some cases we do now, and now we see a lot more um, where museums are really um, opening up and catering to younger people. But for teenagers, this is a really accessible point, uh, a way of thinking about the visual image. And so I think that that is um, also really important too, as well. Go ahead, Jonathan, sorry. Oh, no, no, I, I, well, I have thoughts on that too. I was going to say initially it's, it's that sort of nonsense historical differentiation between illustration and, and art and illustration being something that is typically used to sell a product. And so it's by definition then has a, as an agenda, not fine art. And I think that that's part of what has held uh, comic book art 
back because it's selling a product. And then it's interesting, Shepard, what you just said too, it, the sort of the transition of, of appreciating comic book art now, I think ties very much into the fact that comic books are not uh, uh, really directed to young people anymore. It's people who are our age who are making them and who are buying them. So I think that there's now, there is more of an appreciation for the art because it's the people who are buying them who maybe do have the money to invest in uh, uh, treating this as fine art and appreciating it as fine art as well. That's really interesting. So um, just to follow up on this conversation about audience, um, uh, Jonathan, you were kind of saying that, I mean, well, you're kind of talking more generally, but I would love to hear from each of you, um, definitely Gonzo and Jonathan about who your audience is, like when you're creating, like who are you mm -hmm. thinking of as consuming? And Shilpa, in your experience, maybe to just sort of twist that question for your expertise, um, would you say with Ms. Marvel, like who are they really trying to appeal to with her or Kamala Khan? Uh, you, who, who wants to start? <laughs> Go for it, Gonzo. Okay, all right, I'll go for it. Um, I just don't want to establish like an order. It's always going to be me first. But <laughs> in any case, uh, so so my audience, um, I created like my personal comic, the one that I wasn't just hired to do. Um, or yeah, actually, anyway, uh, the one that I have complete control over. Let's say that um, it was a reaction to, and as a little, a couple of things that Shilpa had, had had touched on is, um, it was a reaction to the representation of Latino culture in American pop culture. Like whenever you saw. Mexico shown in an American movie. It's sepia tone and brown and dirty. And America has fetishized Mexican violence and poverty in a way that is destructive. And then uh, splintered off from that, like people I considered as a Chicano kid, like my heroes, the, the luchadors, were always shown as like like a joke in America. They were always like a punchline and they never wrestled. They always like, you know, they, they didn't get to be heroic. They were always like, oh, look at this dumb guy in a mask. And so I created my audience I'm sorry, I created my, co my comic for an audience of people kind of like me who were just underserved with authentic representation of their culture, like just Latinx people who get to see this Hollywood and, and, and comic book interest in, in the, um, the, these darker elements, uh, like these unfortunate things that happen, you know, in, in Latin culture. But, you know, they're creating this monomyth of gritty realism that's just lazy. It's not, you know, it doesn't really look at the multifaceted and the bright vibrance of my culture. And so I just wanted to, I wanted it to... Um, I wanted to show Latinx culture in a positive light. I wanted to show Lucha Libre in a positive light. Uh, and um, I, I just wanted, uh, I wanted to get the wrestling right. Like I, you know, I, I you know, so it was just, it, it was just a bunch of people who were being underserved and it was a lot of things that were being got wrong a long time. So I'm just like, I, I just want to do it right and be authentic and tell a story that, and, and honestly having worked at you know, McFarland as long as I did, a lot of the work I did, I just couldn't show my children. Uh, so I wanted to make an every age comic. I wanted a 40 year old wrestling fan who was sick of wrestling comics where the wrestlers don't wrestle to enjoy the comic. But I also wanted like my eight year old son to be able to pick it up and just know that it was guys in masks and capes beating on each other. And it was fun and kind of safe. And it you know, didn't need to be like grim and gritty and depressive. I mean, you know, like this weird dourism that has kind of consumed comics as, as a, a as a replacement for maturity, you know, it's like, oh, look how, how gritty, you know, look how miserable everybody is. It must be mature. You know, like, I, I just, I think that's a misstep. So I, I wanted to like, you know, my, my sales pitch for my comic used to be like, hey, remember when comics were fun? Here's my comic book, you know, like they, we're going back to that. So that that's, there's people, I guess, dissatisfied in a lot of areas were who I made my comic book for. Awesome, thanks. I think the, the art that I'm trying to make in comic books is sort of in direct, uh, sort of defiance to those people who, who don't consider comic books fine art. I, I think I'm very actively, or I know I'm very actively making books that challenge, if you don't read comic books and you think comic books are one thing, I want, I'm actively making art that challenges that. It, all of my stuff is traditionally done and it's the large scale paintings, it's watercolor and it's oil and it's ink. And so uh, not to be snobby i hope about it but but if you don't read comic books and you have an idea of what a comic book is i want you to see the work that i'm doing and say like oh, i had no idea that comic books could be something else because it's not just me who's making art or comics that look different to whatever your stereotype is but there's you know any number of artists out there who are doing comic books that look completely different and even beyond the visual are telling stories that are completely different i, I mean i think I can't remember, someone mentioned Archie earlier, which is still around, but 
you know, if, if your idea of comic books is Archie or your idea of comic books is Superman or X-Men or, or you know, superheroes or, or sort of 60s camp, you know, comic books can be anything else and are anything else. And so visually, I, I want to push that idea that, that to, to challenge sort of that lowbrow, which I do appreciate too. I know Gonzo is, is more in that world, but it's like I said in the intro, like that's what I love so much about it. Like we, we go about telling the stories in completely different ways, but we're still telling the stories in ways that are honest to us. And I, and I love what, um, you know, you said Gonzo about finding the joy in comics, mm. because I think that there is that, but Jonathan, I also hear what you're saying about the way in which it can be comics can be different genres too mm -hmm. just like we have in you know that in the literature in the literary world and comics are seen now as um, a way of studying them in the literary world as graphic novels too but I like the way in which um, uh, the genre has been diversified because initially it was a lot of the pulp comics but I think as people aged out uh, that's what Marvel was was looking at and that's what Sana Amanat was looking at was how do we get new readers? Because we know we have an established group, but the established group um, was aging and it was a little bit homogenous too. And she wanted to appeal to a more diverse um, youth. So what did she do? She took the character of Spider-Man, Peter Parker, and um, recreated him in another universe so that it's Miles Morales. Uh, you know, an Afro uh, Latinx character. Um, she took the Hulk, uh, who was Bruce Banner, and made him Amadeus Cho, Korean American. Um, she took uh, Ms. Marvel, who was Carol Danvers, and made her Kamala Khan, a teenager from Jersey City, New Jersey. And so I think, you know, part of this was appealing to a new audience and also reflecting the issues that a lot of those teenagers were going into. And so they, they formed this group called the Champions, which are like against the Avengers. They think that the Avengers are too establishment, that they're, you know, they've been co-opted by the national, you know, corporate uh, entities. And so they say, no, we wanna do something different. We don't wanna be like that. We wanna be more independent. So they're playing out these really interesting generational kinds of divides that I think are, um, that are great. But in, even in that realm, I think that uh, if we look at independent comics, they always were talking about these different kinds of issues too as well. And also thinking about um, race, class and gender representations. And so that's something that I think is, you know, is great to look at. And, you know, there have been different independent works um, and artists and creators. And so, Jonathan Gonzo, it's great to see, you know, the work that you do. When I was teaching a class, um, uh, you know, that was one of the things I was looking for was not just the superheroes because comics are much more than that. And so looking at Persophilus, looking at um, um, Alison Bechdel, right? Um, but it was really hard. I mean, the Brothers Hernandez it was really hard to find comics by that had women or were, were women drew as well as by people of color. And so I was wondering, I would throw it back to you guys to think about like, what has been your experience and sort of how have you seen, you know, the landscape change in terms of the creative bit? I was gonna ask that question or similar question too, Shovel, so that's <laughs> cool. Maybe- uh, Jonathan, you wanna start this one? Or Gonzo, either of you? Uh, well, I, I mean, I was gonna say, I thought about this, a lot with with creators and with characters too you know it's one of those things where the minute you have to say like um and and think of a list of creators of color characters of color like that that says it all you know i don't have to um and think about white male you know creators that's the list that everybody already has established i think that we're obviously we're moving forward there are uh, some books that are being made now. There's a, uh, a couple image books, Excellence and Bitterroot are great ones uh, that are coming out right now that are that are teams of, uh, of creators of color, uh, characters of color, and they're telling stories that I'm sure, you know, resonate with specific communities, but are read and appreciated by someone like me or someone like uh, the white 
30 plus year old comic book fan as well. Um, so I don't know if that sort of, I mean, we're moving in a positive direction and I think that it's important even in, in as much that we've acknowledged as creators and as an industry that this is a, a, a huge lack that we have, um, but it's, it's, you know, early days, unfortunately still. Um, yeah, so I, uh, my comic is, is intentionally at next, like it, it, it's on purpose. Like, I, I, I could have easily called my story like, you know, El Revenjo or something like, like a little easier to palette, but I wanted there kind of a little bit of barrier to entry where I was like, if you can't get past four Spanish words, then my comic is not for you because it is, you know, it, it's, it's Latinx comics by a Latinx author and, and artist, uh, you know, for Latinx audience, you know, like if anyone else wants to enjoy it, that's fine. But um, I made it because I, I felt that like that culture had been misrepresented so, so much that I just really, you know, the, the Spanish that I put in there, uh, I don't translate. There's no, there's no translation for it. If you can't figure it out, then, you know, sorry, I guess, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning pretty hard on it. And because of that, I, um, I end up doing a lot of uh, uh, like, you know, Latin uh, comic con or uh, Latino comic con, I do BCAF a lot with like John Jennings and, and, um, and uh, those guys. So I end up, I've, I'm in this space, you know, like I'm, I'm at shows with Hernandez brothers and like Rafael Navarro is doing Sonombolo and, I, and uh, you know, Brina uh, Taylor, I want to say her name is, uh, sorry. So I, I see a lot of like, you know, Afro Latino, you know, female creators. And, and, and uh, so my world is full of that. So I just think it's like huge and vibrant, you know, we have big cons, we have you know, 100 exhibitors there and it seems like it's doing better than ever. But then I'll go to San Diego and I see that artist alley. I'm like, oh no, we're still, we're still not quite, you know, we're not filling this room ever. But um, so I, yeah, you know, to Jonathan's point, we are getting better and there's a lot more room for people like us to succeed. Like my book's coming out from Image this in, in May too. Like that just hit, you know, and that's a, you know, not only is that our tour comics, that's a one man show. Like, you know, I'm also intentionally like, you know, Chicano about the whole thing too. And, and I'm not hiding it and I lean into that and, and, uh, I mean, it's 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 definitely not a marketing ploy, a, a money grab because you know there, there's there's no money in that, <laughs> but or not you know not there's money in anything, but uh, I um you know it I, I just definitely want to like unashamedly be what I'm about and, and lean into my you know my culture, and I think that um with the success of Marvel doing that with things like Kamala Khan and, and Miles Morales and just um and just being like yeah this might this might bum some people out but the, we kind of don't want them anyway like being okay to like let people go by 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 doing something authentic um you know instead of the half-hearted attempts that the industry did with like black lightning and you know like uh, those sorts of characters you know i mean they're they they have a, a spotty history of inclusion and for them to finally just be like no we're just going to show the authentic real thing that it is and 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 uh and not just put like a an ethnic a veneer on it and then try to pass it on, you know, and then that's the other thing too, is like, you get these, you know, like, oh, well, this, this character is like the first character of color or the first Latina or whatever. And you're like, well, yeah, they had a Spanish last name, but they literally never, their ethnicity never factored into their story at all. And I, I try to like, make sure that like, like, you know, Latin culture is, is the heart of my story. It's the engine that drives it and, and the, the kind of complexities of, of, of being, you know, a mestizo, uh, you know, and, and so I, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm running out of answer here, but that's my point. Is it getting better and oh. uh, still not big enough? I think that's great. I've, there's so many interesting things in what all of you said, but um, the interest, the way you said about language and if you can't get past four Spanish words, like this isn't for you. Um, I think that brings up really interesting questions about sort of story and image and how those things sort of work together. Um, I would love to hear sort of from you to artists, what comes first? Like, does the character come first? Does the kind of the plot come first? Or do you just start drawing? Like what what happens, what comes first? Um, and uh, and then Shopa, I would love to hear from you too about like sort of that connection between story and, um, and art and, and what, you know, how that pieces together. I mean, what comes first just depends on how many people you're working with, I think. You know, I mean, some sometimes Gonzo and I, I think we have both worked on teams and we both worked independently. You know, as the artist, you're you're more often than not a hired gun, and you you know you're brought in to tell a story. Um, in which case, the story has come first, but the visual language has not been established yet. So we get a lot of room to play with that. Um, but on independent stuff, it can come from anywhere. 
or, you know, start with an idea. There's a there's a, a, a creator owned project that I'm just beginning now. And it was it was very much I had this idea for a character and I started to build a story around the image of this character. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a case by case for me, at least case by case thing. Yeah. And for you, Gonzo? Oh, for me, you know, even when I'm doing my own stuff, even when I'm doing like Lamano, it's like this, the story, the idea of the story has to come first. Like what, what, what am I trying to say here? Um, and I spent, you know, uh, you know, 30 years in advertising now. And I, and I, and I'm always about like, you know, what are we really selling? Like, that's always my, my question is like, what's, what's at the core, like the resonance of this, you know, what, what is the, what's the core idea? And then I build everything around that. So my, I, I want to, address ideas of identity and destiny and kind of the um, complexity of identity that uh, that mestizo people in like you know Mexico and in America have like you know mixed people because it's like a, a lot of that inherent identity is is um, has to get washed away because of its conflicts its internal conflicts right so and then you know like I, I decided that I'd use a luchador as my, my cipher for those those sorts of notions of like being able to assume an identity and just become defined by your actions and so and then things just start shaking out from there. And then once the story is there, I start drawing. And then I know it's a cliche and a lot of writers say this, but eventually like the, the characters and the situations just sort of like write themselves. It's like you put a character in a situation and there's only one way that person's going to have to act. And then, you know, but as far as like what I put on the page, I really start to think about what the emotional truth of each moment is because, you know, no one, no one cares about what you say and no one cares about what they see. They care about how they feel about what you, they say and what they see. And I, as an artist, primarily, I like to, I like to convey as much of that from the visuals as possible and let the words just kind of supplement it. I like to show and not tell because it is a visual medium. And I, and I think that to that end, like I try to think about the emotional truth of the moment, what the arc of the, the, that spread of the page is going to be like, where it's going to go, you know, and then I try to create as many, um, you know, what, what my art history teacher called pregnant moments, you know, these moments, like capture these moments that just have possibility where people are doing enough and, and suggesting enough that the reader can then fill in their motivations, their, their mood, their, you know, like where they're, where they've been and where they're going, you know, like I, I try to not have talking heads as much as possible and try to make people like doing stuff, you know, so that like you get a sense of their personality just in posture, like, what, you know, if, if I'm sitting on a desk talking to someone, like, what did I grab off their desk while I was talking? Did I grab the stapler and start stapling it? Or, you know, all of these like tiny little things that are, that are more telling about the story than if I had just written, he's nervous telling the story and then have him say some words. It's like, you know, draw, you know, so everything is in service of the story because it's a narrative medium. Like at the end of the day, the pictures tell the story, which I think is, you know, back to that first point we were talking about, I think comic art can be designed, right? Like it's just, you know, it's, it's art in service of, a narrative and so therefore design and not fine art or could be construed as such but I think the the sum total of the book then becomes the art with the words included and so yeah you know my mine is always in service of the story um and never tripping it like my honestly my biggest concern when I'm doing my own book is getting out of my own way is not becoming such an artist that I'm putting too much down and and, and doing disservice to the story that's awesome one of the one of the things that I always ask um, my students when they are confronting a comic book, and, the, and it would be, I think you would be surprised at how many people in my classes have never read comics before. That so when I assign one, they're like, whoa, you're assigning a comic? And it's the first time many of them have ever read a book, which is, which is really wonderful. And what I ask them is, well, what do you look at first? You know, when you're reading it, when you open it up, what do you look at, text? or image. And I think that that's always telling because one, it makes them focus on what they are. I will uh, reveal, I am a text person. I look at the text first. Um, I think that's the way that I sort of put context around a story or the image that I'm seeing too as well. But we talk about that. So I think it's, it's interesting when you're thinking about storytelling and how that might work. Um, how does it work with a particular image? The other thing that I love about comic books, uh, I, I, there's two things I love. Uh, I love many things, obviously, but one, um, first of all, it's a physical object. I know you, you can do digital comics and I know that those are popular, but there's something wonderful about be a, being able to hold something in your hand and go back and just sit there quietly with that moment of, of reading and figuring out what's going on. 
And so I think, um, you know, I love that it's physical and I love that you can stop and just focus on an image. And I'm, I'm wondering, Jonathan and Gonzo, when you are drawing, um, when you're sort of creating um, something, do you think, how do you sort of craft uh, your image? Do you think about scale? Do you, how do you block it? And, and I know you said you work with a team, but if this was just you creating your own thing, um, how do you, how do you manage like the, the gutters and the, you know, the size and how do you plot that out? I'm just really curious. Actually, that's a really good question. Someone in the audience had asked, um, uh, they said for Gonzo and Jonathan, you tell a story in a sequence of boxes. What is your relationship with that framing? So really similar uh, to what you just asked. Shilpa. Um, I can start this if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Is that cool? Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I've got, you know, graphic design training. And so I just, it, it's layout, it's like spatial tension, it's size, it's, it's the, you know, it's all the elements in, of design, right? It's like rhythm, uh, you know, spacing, uh, balance, all of those. Sorts. So it depends on, again, it depends on the emotional truth of the moment. Like if this is a fight scene, then I want the, the panels to look dynamic. So they might be at angles and they might cut into each other and overlap because it's like, it's one moment after another and they're st literally stacking up on the page. If it's a quiet somber moment, it might be like really, you know, square on the page and, and the straight on view. Um, again, it's just the emotional truth of the moment. Like, you know, I, 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 I view, you know, my job as an illustrator is to abbreviate reality and not to reflect it completely. And so I'm trying to give them just enough hints so that they fill the rest in with their own personal experience, you know, which is, again, is one of the unique things about comic books is, is the, um, is that, that uh, you're asking the reader to co-author it with you, right? They're filling in the stuff that handle, happens between the, the panels and they're filling it in with personal experience and expectation. So literally the book that they read is, is personal to them. It's the, it's the only version of that that lives in their head. And, and, and a little, going back to a little bit of what Shifla was saying is like, when it comes to being able to hold a comic, like I love leaning into the fact that it's a comic book. I love doing stuff you can only do with a comic book. It, one of which is tactile and, 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 and smell. Like I print my comics on uncoated newsprint so that it's evapor I'm sorry, it's absorption print rather than evaporated. So the ink is in the paper, not on the paper. So when you pull it open, you can feel the paper with your thumbs. You can smell the ink coming off of it. And I can't tell you how many people will open my comic up and I see them slowly pull it toward their face a little bit because they get that hint of printer's ink on there that you just don't get anymore with shiny slick comic books. And part of that, and, and also I, I distress my comics to look like old 60s comics, both thematically because my comic happens in the 60s, but also because um, you know, like you can see the, the inks aren't quite, like the black's not quite hundred percent. It slips around a little bit because those old flexography plates wouldn't, wouldn't grab quite right because it's direct press and not offset. And so like, I have a little bit of that, like that weird warble to the plates and you can see the picking of the inks. And, and, and to me, it's, um, it lowers the expectation of the, the, uh, the reader, or not lower, it, it, it mitigates their expectation because, you know, I think it, like, it was Updike who said that all great art has a confession of artifice. And I want my comic to be a confession of artifice. Like I limit my color palette to like nine colors, three of which are used on Lamato. The rest of are make up the rest of the color. Or I don't think there's like 12 colors. Anyway, um, and I'm telling, like I'm starting my story with like, look, this is a story. And then I tell that. And now it's not like, how does this jive with your sense of reality or what would really happen? This is like, no, this is a story. I, I'm not going to let something like the truth get in the way of a good story. So uh, all everything I do in my comic is a confession of artifice, including panel stuff that you can only do with the way that you arrange stuff or the, the angle you can take on something, you know, like in the comics, you can get like a camera from inside someone's mouth looking out at their cup of coffee or in literally a bullet passing through someone's brain, like all of the things I've seen done in comics, you know, and now you can do that with movies, but, but you can't sit on those images. Like, you know, it, the way comics mess with time too, like you, you have the ability to, to speed up and slow down the way that, that you can't do in other mediums. And, and then also the reader has like, can do that on their own. And so like, how do you control their experience? Like, do I make the panels really thin? Do I make them really long so that they linger on the moment or really tall and short, you know, all of that is consideration. There's a million little tiny things, but for me, the consideration is always, how does it serve the emotionality of the, of the story I'm trying to tell? Lots of flexibility there, it sounds like. Jonathan? Yeah. I like that, uh, that's old school, man. Printing on yeah. news, that uncoded newsprint. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with all of that. I, I don't have any sort of training uh, background. So a lot of mine is more what feels and looks right to me as far as composing a page. But it's a, it's a conversation that, that you sort of build with the audience and with the reader. And as readers ourselves and comic book readers, you know, there's sort of a shorthand that, that you come to understand. Um, 
I, I completely agree with Donza with, with you're saying the you know it's all it's about the emotional sort of import of the moment. So you know you want to invite the reader to lean into the story that you're telling. If it's if it's an action scene, again, like like I'm just repeating Gonzo stuff. But you know you can use harder edges and you can use more dynamic angles. If if there's something, if I want you the reader to slow down, then I can actually add panels to slow your eye instead of one big panel to just sit there and then move on. I can compose the page if it's, you know, we've got our protagonist and he just, you know, went through something traumatic. Maybe he's very small. There's a big uh, space of background behind him and it's all, you know, one flat color. And it's sort of inviting the reader into that, that same headspace. And those are very obvious examples, but uh, I think that, you know, when you're composing the page for me, and this is not unique, you know, I'm, I'm trying to compose the panels as being interesting panels, but the page itself has to work in harmony. I'm going to lead the reader across in a certain way and in a certain direction if I can, or, or uh, 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 with a certain like velocity if I can to slow and speed up where I think the story needs it and, and where the emotional resonance is going to be the strongest. That's so fascinating because so much of our history has to do with composition and leading the mm. eye around and they're very similar concerns. So that's, that's really, it's really wonderful. I'm going to kick it to Lisa because I know we've had a couple of questions um, about things that you all have already touched on. So Lisa. Yeah, so there are a lot of really good questions coming in, um, a, a few that are related to accessibility. Um, so one question is, how do you think increased access to comics, um, like through web comics, has changed the art form? Hmm. I, I think Anyone that got an it, <laughs> well, I think that it's it's made making comics easier. Whether I mean, none of us are getting rich off of this anyway. But you know, especially with web comics, you know, you're not you're not paying bills with it necessarily, but you're making comics and you're being being read, uh, you know, you you are a cartoonist at that point. And I think that's awesome. I mean, the quality of published big two comics is all over the place. And that's no different to independent webtoons comics that are made by someone, you know, on their day off in their basement. You know, it, it's, there's, there's zero sort of entry fee at this point. It's interesting too, because you're really, comics is becoming a mixed media kind of form then. So it's not just about, um, you know, the two dimensionality of, of the comic book um, and, and the physical. You can think about it in terms of gra um, computer and graphic design work. You can think about it in terms of animation. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, where we're going with comic art, um, you know, in the 90s, when Mouse was published and got the Pulitzer Prize, right, suddenly it was a graphic novel, and it became on vogue and very, you know, un, you know, high culture to be able to teach graphic novels. And English departments jumped on this, where they were saying, oh, now we can teach this as a, as a form of novel. And a lot of people wonder, you know, graphic novel is really um, a narrative that's usually in one story. Um, in one particular book, whereas comics are seen as much more a serialized narrative or something that doesn't end that you have to keep on um, buying over and over again, like stay tuned next time, right? Um, uh, but what uh, the comics industry has done is now they've bound all of those serial books into one particular volume. So you can then um, either collect the individual ones or you can get the entire collected volume so that you can read them all in a row and you don't have to wait too. And so that, um, that uh, slippery slope between what is a comic and what is a graphic novel, I think is interesting. But I'm wondering what did, um, Jonathan, what do you think about that? I always say that I'm a comic book artist and a comic book illustrator or a cartoonist. And I, one of the books, one of the self-published books I did, fully painted, it's a hundred pages, it's oversized, it's a comic book. It's not a graphic novel, because graphic novels to me have always been uh, sort of what people who don't read comics and, and turn, look down their nose at comics call something like Mouse, which is an absolute work of art. It's not a, I mean, it's a graphic novel, fine, but it's a comic book, it's, it's the exact same thing 
it's the exact same media as Superman or as Archie. It's a comic book and we should celebrate that. I don't have, pro I don't have a problem with the term graphic novel, but especially what you were just saying, Shil, but like, what then is the difference between Mouse as a graphic novel and, you know, I have next to me right now, you, you know, Batman number 27 through 32 that's just been collected and reprinted as a graphic novel. Like, the, you know, the, the, the term graphic novel shouldn't really hold that much weight, in my opinion. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, 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 oh, agree, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you, Jonathan. Um, I always thought it was it was funny, but again, you know, it, it's this idea of what is, you know, it's a high culture, low culture kind of split. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's respectability politics. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, you know, I, when people ask me the difference between a graphic novel and a comic book, I tell them, well, you have to hold a graphic novel with your pinkies out. It's a marketing ploy. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's what uh, Will Eisner did to, to get a book sold that was just a complete story. He came up with the word so that people who poo-pooed comic books could feel good about buying it so he could get it in bookstores so he could make more money off of it. It was a marketing ploy. And nowadays it's respectability politics. And like, I know people who want to be cool who just say graphic novel because they don't want to sound like they're reading Archie comics. Again, like that, you know, what's considered kind of like, uh, you know, juvenile, right? They want to look mature. And, uh, and no, man, I say comic books. I always tell people, I make comic book ass comic books. Like they look, feel and smell like them. And back to the, the point about the web and the original question, uh, I, I kind of, I make comic books. Uh, uh, digital comic books are a simulacrum of that. Like they're not comic books. They're, they're an approximation of them. I use the web to sell my comic books. And that's, that's the only way some people can get them. I mean, that's what we'll do, but nothing beats holding it and feeling it and smelling it. You know, like you, you can't, and, and honestly, yeah, you can't smell an iPad screen and you can't get it signed by me either. I mean, I could, it's going to ruin your iPad screen though. So, you know, it, it's just, it, it's a breach of the contract between what I create and what I'm trying to give to people and like the people I'm trying to give it to, you know, like to give them uh, information that can be accessed on a screen is a, is a breach of contract in my opinion. And I really, you know, it's done great. And I think what it has done, which has been great for it is that now um, it's kind of shown some cracks in the system. It's democratized the marketplace of ideas to a certain degree, wherein my comic can be as successful as a Marvel comic given the right circumstances or interest, right? Like, you know, it, it, you know, it's not about shelf space anymore because someone can look at my book as much as they can look at Spider-Man 500 or whatever came out, you know, this month, you know, and, and, and that's great. And, and it also, and that barrier to entry that Jonathan was talking about is also like, out. Yeah, I can get it out there in the same manner as the big two. And now, now we're fighting about, you know, now it's a meritocracy. Now who's got the better idea is, is going to win. And the big companies are going to win a lot on volition, but every so often something small shows up that just gets the right amount of shine to it and it, and it does well. And everyone's like, you know, what, where did this come from? And I think the, the black and white boom of the eighties kind of proved that, that like ideas can win out, you know, if, if just that little, you know, that little tipping point can happen. But yeah, as far as um, the medium itself, uh, it, it's a, it's a knockoff. It, it's Urzat's comics. It's, it's not real in my opinion. And then, and then also I, I bristle at the idea of graphic novels. I think it's respectability politics. And, uh, and I think we need to just go back to saying comic books. You know, I, I like saying funny books too. I just, you know, cause you know, so few of them are funny these days. It's just, yeah, it, it, they are what they are, you know? I mean, like the word movie is ridiculous, right? You know, people who say film or cinema, you know, I, I have an equal uh, amount of contempt for people who say that they enjoy cinema. I'm like, oh, you like movies? Okay, I gotcha, you mm -hmm. know? So I, it, it's pedantic at best and, and, and boorish at worst. Well, I would, I would like to do another shout out to the public libraries, because I think the libraries have done a great job in uh, increasing the collection of their comic book collections. Um, and so that it's available to so many people um, at, you know, who may not be able to afford every collection um, that's out there too, as well. So I think, at, you know, accessibility is something that we're seeing more and more of different kinds, not just the superhero books. And well, I, I'll say for me personally, I sort of fell out of comic books for a couple of years and it was a library that had the Sandman collected editions that brought me right back in. <laughs> you know, it, 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 I had never seen comic books in libraries up until that point, really. So I love what you all have said about like holding it in your hands and smelling it and like the sort of tactile nature of comic books, um, because, you know, that you know, that's definitely a topic that museums think about a lot about their objects and preserving them as objects and thinking about art as objects. And so I love that that hasn't, that, 
despite web comics, but that hasn't been sort of lost. You all also have made us, I don't know about Lisa, but I mean, feel really good about calling this the art in life comic books versus the art in life graphic novels. Um, so <laughs> thanks for that. Um, yeah. And those were, there were actually a couple of questions from the audience um, wanting to know your thoughts about the difference between comics and graphic novels. So yeah, I think, um, I think you made your thoughts very clear on that. <laughs> Uh, hey Lisa, do you want to kick up that question about gender yeah. and sexual identity? Yeah, so this I thought was a really um, important question. Um, they're asking, um, they want your thoughts. What about the physical depiction of comic book heroes, their bodies and costumes? Um, and this seems to seems like it's been more problematic for females with hypersexualizing their characters. So, um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'll jump in. If, uh, is that cool? Anyone else want to? Or? No, okay, go so, ahead. Um, so, so for me, it was important that my Latino characters look Latino. Like I wanted my brown people to look brown. Uh, I also wanted my luchadors to look like wrestlers and not like underwear models. So there were no abs. Like my one of my rules was like no abs. Like I'm not going to draw like six packs on anybody. Um, and then there are, I wanted there to be uh, women involved in the story and women wrestlers. And again, like I wanted my women wrestlers to look like women wrestlers. Like I wanted them to be like thick, dominating, you know, strong looking women and not just, you know, like the attitude era WWE wrestlers who were just underwear models that Vince taught how to how to wrestle, right? Like it was important to me that they they look like Latinas, that they look powerful, that they that their sexuality not even come into question. You know what I mean? Like I don't like I, I'm not going to define them in relationship to their boyfriends or husbands or who they're dating or after or whatever. Like I, it was it, it was very important to me um, primarily because and I've talked about this before in other places is uh, you know, especially at like BCAF and at like, like uh, Latino Comic Con and stuff is like, um, you know, we have a lot of queer creators uh, in that community that I know that 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 I've you know been on panels with, and and the African American and the Latino communities can be the last bastions of homophobia because of their ultra religious kind of uh, ethos that permeates their cultures, and I think that sometimes as a minority we get caught up in like one thing at a time like well we just need to make sure we've got our civil rights before we start accepting you know trans rights we're like no 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 we can do this all at once we can uh you know we can we can take it all on at once and we can work towards solutions to all of them and i think that um sometimes even the mainstream gets caught up like that like oh we got a muslim character we can't make her gay too or we couldn't you know like we don't want to move too far out like, like too fast you know like we don't want to alien our audience and 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 to me i just think that's a um that should be a non-issue. Like we should just be emblematic of and representative of the world at large and whatever makes sense for those stories, you know, like, um, and, and I've tried my best just to do that. You know, like I really wanted to get like an exotico, which is a tradition of uh, trans wrestlers in Mexican wrestling that, that goes back to like the sixties, you know, or I'm sorry, like the fifties. Um, I just didn't have the artistic skill to draw a man dressing like a woman as a, you know, like it just, it didn't, it, it just looked like a dude when I did it. And then it did. And then it just, started looking just like a woman when I went the other way. And I, I, I thought there was going to be too many narrative gymnastics that needed to happen to explain it or point it out. And I didn't want to like call it out. So um, I, I think I've skill level wise, I think I can pull it off on my next series of comics. So I'm going to do it there, but yeah, it's important to me to be inclusive of all those people just to show that I'm not doing this one thing at a time kind of approach to it. I, I think that's part of what, uh, artistically at least has pushed me further away from the superhero sort of genre is uh are, are those are those stereotypes that that the whoever asked the question pointed out um I, yeah I, I think you know I, I live in New York now and I lived in California for a long time and I you know the communities my communities of friends I want to to see in the comic books that I read, uh, and so even as as a you know white creator, I see if if the world that I'm creating and the books that I'm reading is not representative of the world in which I live, then I've done something wrong. I think that's that's really powerful. I mean, part of what you know, you want to see too when you're picking up a book is something that is reflective too of, of you. 
And what I really liked about the way in which, you know, uh, the first issues, particularly in Adrian uh, uh, Alfonso um, does, Alfana does in uh, Ms. Marvel, is that you could see even in that slide I showed that there are different body types for different people. And um, especially when you're talking about Asian and Asian American characters, depending upon what rate, you know, nationality or ethnicity they are, um, Asian women tend to be hypersexualized too as well. So to be able to see, um, you know, a superhero character say, wait, I'm not going to be that. And then she struggles over even what her costume will look like. And that, cause she wants it to be practical. And, and she has these sort of conversations like, how does somebody run around in these high heeled boots? You know, I can't do that. Um, and so I think that's what more and more, um, you know, those kinds of conversations, it's nice to see those show up in, in books. Uh, but we still have, you know, as we've seen from, you know, the Marvel and the Marvel comics and others, we still have um, women who are hypersexualized, who are not, um, we're seeing that in, in, and we're seeing that in particularly in the movies um, too as well. But in the books, I'm glad to see you're doing other stuff too. And, and I like, you hope that that will translate to the big screen. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, we, we would like to see that, especially with women, I think. Yeah, I really want to see, um, I want to see a woman who's kind of like unlikable. You know what I mean? Because like most female comic book characters are always kind of likable. You know what I mean? Like they have to be like a, like you know pretty and, and you know. But then you'll have these men who are like anti heroes. You get Wolverine who's just telling Professor X to f off, and they can be kind of like, you know, men are free to be, you know, dicks. I guess for lack of a better term. And like you know, and and everyone goes, oh, I want to be that kind of dick, you know. But like if a if a woman is even slightly abrasive, like just the um, you know, as it was part and parcel to the 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 um, Captain Marvel movie like her story was about becoming like being less uh, of the kind of like emotionless, you know, thing that they, they had created, you know, and, and learning to tap into her, like her inner strength, which was those emotions and stuff. But like, you know, people really bristled at the fact that she was like, uh, she wasn't like likable, that she was kind of like uh, focused and mission-based and, and, and things that they would have loved in a male character. And they were just like, oh, they weren't having it from a woman. Cause yeah, man, every woman in every Marvel movie is just real, real likable. And I'm like, no, nah, I want, I kind of want to, I kind of want to dick you know, at least one of these times, like someone who's like, yeah, you know, but uh, yeah, like at least having that variety would be nice to see. It's sort of how you were talking about being on a panel where there is, there can be only one. And so until we see multiples where one person doesn't have to represent one particular group, but that we can have like an ensemble of women who are working together or an ensemble of different kinds, um, uh, you know, of people. I think that's that's what we're you know aiming towards to get to get a little bit more of range in in multiple kinds of characters. Fascinating, um, Lisa. Did you have another question? Yeah. Yeah. So well, um, there are so many questions. I don't know if we're going to get to them all tonight, but I, I think it's interesting that um, the conversation has headed in a direction that some questions are touching upon, and uh, based on what you were all just talking about. Um, someone is asking, how did your career career path um, and those you know in the industry differ because of yours or their ethnicity, um, gender presentation or identity, and other minority factors in comics? Well, I got a good one. I can I can take. I'll start this real quick because uh, this will be quick. Um, when I did La Mano del Destino, I was given the advice to call it like El Revenjo or something. Uh, I had other bigger publishers interested that wanted to anglify it in a way. I had some Hollywood. Um, and then uh, when I wanted to do the, um, oh, shoot, man, I think, is my, am, I, am I good? Am I, am I internet collection okay? Sorry. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, when I wanted to do my trade paperback, I wanted to do it in English and Spanish uh, as a flip book. So it all it my there's a version of my trade paperback that I ended up having a Kickstarter because I was told by the industry Spanish language comics don't sell, mm -hmm. um, which I have my issues with. I, I think what they meant was like, oh, when we translate Spider-Man into Spanish, it doesn't sell, which is fine because that's an American hero doing American things. But I think that like a distinctly Latino subject matter in Spanish would probably do better than you think. So I had to Kickstarter my book, which was um, you know, in English on one side and you flip it over and it's all the issues again in Spanish on the other side. 
and and yeah, I would time and time again, I, I would like, you know, try to get in the direct market. I tried to, to sell that through diamond and stuff and was just told no and just had to do it for myself. So uh, I, I think that is a prime example of um, kind of the easy thinking that this industry tends to do. I think it's a lot of the kind of uh, the issues of representation. The, the reason that it's not as diverse as it could be is because what has sold is what people want to sell and nobody can think outside of that, that kind of like status quo. I mean, since I'm not a creator, <laughs> I can't speak to that as much. But what I'll say is that um, I think it's really interesting as a woman going when I used to go into comic book stores. I mean, I would walk in and people would do a double take because I was the only woman and I was also a woman of color. And so um, if you wanted to go and buy a book, you know, the owners always knew exactly who I was because I used to collect and I would go in and get my, you know, my, my packet. Um, but I will say that there are some great comic book stores um, that are also um, uh, uh, female owned too. Um, uh, they're, they're actually a group of women that called the Valkyries. And um, there's one here, there's a comic book um, store here in Charlottesville, it's Telegraph Comics. And part of that is their mission is to really bring in not only uh, the, bring in people who normally don't go into comic book stores, including women, but also including, um, you know, young people too. And they have different sections for children and they have, a, and then they have young adult and then they do have like the rate, you know, the, the adult section too, as well. So again, making um, room for different kinds of readers. I think that that is important um, in the spaces where comic books are, are distributed. Totally. Um, do you wanna bring up any other audience questions, Lisa? Uh, the one that we wanna finish on? Yeah, um, let's see. So, well, there, first of all, there are a couple of people who are interested in, um, any advice, it would have to be brief advice on, you know, breaking into this industry. Um, if you like one thing. Yeah, like what, yeah, what's your one hot tip? <laughs> I'm still trying to break in, man, I don't know. <laughs> uh, make comic books, that's all I can tell people. Yeah, like do make, your own independent yeah. comic because the guys who get to decide who gets to do things like to do things with people who do things, so do things. And they're going to trust that you're going to be professional and you're only going to improve the more the more you work. It's all about the work. Unfortunately, there's no like tips or shortcuts. It's just do doing the work constantly. So did you always know you wanted to like draw comic books? Because I think we were having this conversation earlier where I said I was tracing things and then Gonzo's like, oh, you could have been an anchor. I'm like, nobody <laughs> ever told me that. Maybe that's the career not you know, that I didn't do. <laughs> did you always know that you were going to do this or how did you get to where you are now? Was it, you know, I had soul searching? A, <laughs> well, so I had a funny experience when I was in, I, I thought I definitely wanted to do comic books. I'd love comic books. I want to draw, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then when I was in high school, my senior year, I was, my, my school had a program where you could do a, a senior project. It was called, I was like, right, I want to do a comic book. I work with this writer that I know. You get to spend like the last couple of weeks or the last couple of months of the year, you know, doing this uh, independent project. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And it, I, it, we finished it, but just, and it was for a little 17 year old me crushing. I said, no, I can't do this. I, this is work. This is not fun anymore. This is work. This is a job. I can't, I don't want to do this. I can't handle this. I can't do this, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, you know, I went off and I matured a little bit and I realized it is what I want and sort of circled back around. So with, with that giant sort of roadblock or, or hurdle uh, cleared, it was clear that this was the, what I wanted to do. Yeah. For me. Uh, yeah, I just never stopped. I uh, the second I saw the um, Spider-Man newspaper strip in the in the newspaper, like just seeing that art style juxtaposed with all the other kind of comic strip stuff that was in there, I just it was for me it was just Spider-Man. I mean, like I literally like I have I have the word Thwip tattooed on the inside of this finger, and then a spider web on that. So when I do the Spider-Man sign, it it says Thwip. Yeah, I I just love Spider-Man, and and once I saw it drawn like that, I'm like that's 
I'm going to do that. And I love drawing. That was like four years, like literally four years old. And I just never stopped through all of like, you know, through art school and they tried to beat it out of me through graphic design school, through my time as a tattoo artist and as a, uh, in, in working in advertising, I was just always drawing comic book stuff. And then once I got the job with McFarland and it was like, oh, I can kind of like lean into this. Uh, and then I got to meet people in the industry. And then once I got out and wanted to do my own project, um, and I was encouraged by a lot of the people I knew in the industry, you know, like most notably like Larry Martyr, who's like an independent comic, uh, comic book kind of like guru. He was just like, yeah, man, just do your thing. Like, he's like, you're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. You'll figure out how to make your own comics. And I did, you know, just see, again, that's, it goes back to my advice. Just do it. Just make comic books, you know, and you'll, your next one will be better than your last one. Just always tell your, just know that that's true and just keep moving forward. Yeah. So since four years old, I've just, this is, it's just stubbornness. I mean, that's probably the answer. <laughs> this is what I always tell to people who want to make comics or who want to do art at all in general, like drawing or painting is, is a technical skill that anybody can learn you know, the, the talent or the ability of the artist is that you want to do it 12 hours a day, every day, forever. And, and yeah. like Gonzo said, like that's the, the only end result of that is improvement. When yeah, I was- my reward would, oops, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to catch up. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say when I was, when I'm teaching this, right, to college students and I'm like, go ahead and draw. And, and everyone is very self-conscious, right? About drawing. And I'm like, you were doing this when you were little, you know you were. And I said, I'm not judging here because uh, uh, an image can, you know, reveal so much feeling and, and just in a single image, then it's about the power of images. And so, you know, Gonzo, when you said, you know, people were trying to like take it away. Uh, I think that's the idea is, um, I think we need to celebrate it more um, in all of its forms too. And I think that's what comics can do. And you guys have shown, you know, you clearly love what you do and and you're successful at it too. Um, you know, and I, and so I think that that's terrific. And that's why I want, you know, you to like meet my students too, as well to be like, this is something you can do. Can I ask Shilpa, what comics do you teach? You, you said like first day of class, you, you assign comics or something. What? Yeah, well, I've, I've done um, all different kinds. So I have taught mouse. I teach um, American Born Chinese by Jean Yang. Mm -hmm. um, I do, when Ms. Marvel came out, I did the superhero comma and did Wonder Woman too, as well. Um, Persophilus. Um, uh, I used to kill, uh, I, for a more um, uh, extreme class, we would read The Killing Joke, um, mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes it was book to screen kinds of things, but there's always new stuff that's going on too as well. And um, especially in, there's a lot of Asian American graphic novels that are coming out too. And it's become this really ripe uh, place for people to go and, and look at, um, at literature Mm -hmm. um, in alternative forms. And I really do believe that, that, um, you know, storytelling comes in so many different ways. And, and how do we look at an image? You know, when I think that's the key thing. And I was just talking with my class um, yesterday about looking at photography and thinking about like, how do we read an image? What do we look for, you know, in terms of the way it's, you know, the coloring, the inking, the, the light, the, um, the angle, and all of that is in comic book drawing too. You guys have to deal with all of that too in terms of visuality. And we think about that in art. And so I think it crosses so many different um, areas and sort of this idea of, you know, John Berger's ways of seeing kind of thing. It's like, how do we visualize um, our different ways of, emo you know, of a, how do we visualize our emotions? And, and that's what comics can really do is help us uh, talk about that. I love that you finished on that note, Chopo, because um, there's been little conversations here and there about emotions. And um, I think that is one of the directions that I would love to go if we have, if we had a lot more time, but I just want to respect everyone's time um, and give two shout outs. And then we're going to finish with one last question from the audience. So quick shout out to Aaron Miller, who teaches graphics uh, here in town. We're really glad that he joined tonight and to Telegraph, who um is a uh, a shop that sells comic books um here in, here in Charlottesville so we're really grateful for the work that they're doing uh as well at least here in our community in Charlottesville Lisa 
Yeah, and and Shilpa, I hope you told your class that they were expected to attend tonight. But um... <laughs> <laughs> I invited them to come. I'll I'll talk to them next week and see if they did. <laughs> yeah. um, so last fun question. Um, we have some people that want to know what are your favorite comic books. Like oh, a <laughs> Well, of all time, or one that you love that you're reading right now? Jeez. I know that's probably a really hard question. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm going to say uh, my favorite comics are uh, Spider-Man, like, 32 and 33, you know, uh, which is, you know, oh, God, I forgot the title on it. It's the one where he lifts the heavy thing. It's the first time he does it, and it's amazing. Like, that uh, did, did go drawing of him picking it up because he has to be there for his family. It's, like, amazing. And uh, Marvel 2-in-1 Annual number 7, uh, again, I mean, like, I, I, you know, I was, I was thinking about this when Shilpa was talking because, like, it, it, it's important to look at things like, you know, like Mouse and and uh, Persopolis and things like that. But I think there's a lot to be gleaned from like dumb comics. You know what I mean? Like, I, I learned about perseverance in the face of a certain annihilation from, you know, from Ben Grimm in Marvel Two and One Annual Number uh, Number Seven. It, it's a dumb comic, but. Once you know, like, once you know who Ben Grimm is, and you see him refuse to stay down, it's like that, that's that's just good as Shakespeare. I mean, you know, like I, I you know, like I read Steinbeck. I know, like you know, I, I understand like you know the, the the hardships of a long lived life, but man, nothing nothing's gonna hit me the same way that Ben Grimm refusing to stay down will. So yeah, read dumb comics. There's there's a reason that they resonate, you know. And, and uh, yes, Mouse is important, but so is the thing. <laughs> that's a good quote. What about Jonathan? you, Jonathan? Uh, I, I'm literally looking through my bookshelves as, as uh, Gonzo was talking. The, my go-to answer has always been Sandman because it, like I said, it's what brought me back into comics. And then it just, you know, those Dave McKean covers and the, the stories that Gaiman was telling really broadened my horizons. Um, I think artistically, you know, I always look to, you know, stuff like, some of the old epic comics, you know, uh, Epic Illustrated and then Marvel had an epic line. It's a book called Moon Shadow that was one of the first painted comics that I ever saw. And it was just another one of those things that like, it just shifted the way that I think. Um, and then for reading dumb comics, I'll say, this is a, a recent comic. One of my favorite comics from the past couple of years was a, a book called Murder Falcon. Oh, that yes. was done by uh, 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 Daniel Warren Johnson. Uh, Daniel Warren Johnson wrote and and did the art, and it is so. It's called Murder Falcon. It's about uh, like a heavy metal band that gets visited and then has to save the world with this giant falcon who plays guitar. And it sounds dumb as shit, and it kind of is. <laughs> but I cried and I cheered. It 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 like this. I'm not going to say secondary story. The the other part of the story is you know the the relationship of the band to, you know, within the band, the relationship to one of the people with his girlfriend, there's, I guess this is a spoiler, so maybe turn off your ears if you don't want to hear, uh, <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, there, it's dealing with issues of, of healthcare and there's a cancer scare, there's triumph at the end. It's everything that I love in comics was in was in that comic and so it is a dumb comic but it's also a beautiful story and and beautiful art uh it's it's everything that comics should aspire to be <laughs> well i i started out when with uh the new teen titans yes that dates me right and um x-men and so i still think that x-men extinction agenda is still one of my favorites um, to I've always loved Spider-Man. I think that's why I like Kamala Khan so much is because she reminds me of Spider-Man. In fact, uh, it, it's so many times. Um, I love um, Saga by Brad Vaughn. Um, I actually have taught Why the Last Man, which, is the, um, which I, I found very fascinating, but I love Saga. And um, there's this, also this book called Lumberjanes, which is very fun. And it's just, uh, it's just a, a great. So I, I look at all different things. And of course, um, uh, Wonder Woman. It's really interesting reading like the, the first uh, issues again, because you're like, wow, this woman is, you know, she's just really cool. Now you have to put it in the context of the 1930s. So there's a lot of, you know, they'll, they'll have a lot of the trigger warnings like, whoa, 
she's progressive in this way, but oh, you know, it's still not really, it, it, it doesn't really do well with Asians or with African Americans or, or other issues too. But um, yeah, I just, I mean, who doesn't, I, I just love Wonder Woman and I, and I like what's happening with, with the new character too, as well. So I think there's a lot of different things. Oh, and then there's this um, great kids thing called Bone. Did you, I don't know if you guys ever read Bone. Of um, course. Which, yeah, was, yeah. which is so much fun. So I think there's like a lot of YA stuff, young adult, that's really, really coming out. And I mentioned before, I teach American born Chinese. And then there's this other book called Monstrous, which I think is really, really beautiful. Um, just uh, the, the illustration, the visuals are just gorgeous. It's just such a beautiful book to open up and look at. A big thank you to all of our wonderful panelists and everyone who attended.